a Jamaican accent. It's, uh, it goes on the internet and it'll ruin you forever. I know, it's, it's culturally insensitive. I'm just warning you. <laughs> Tell me, it's what it is. <laughs> Except preach it. Is that Donald? Oh my goodness, so good to see everybody tonight. Welcome to Putnam. Uh, I, I'm loving the weather. Am I the only one? Am I? Uh, yes. yes. Hey, okay, I think I think it's about unanimous. I love this time. Uh, and we get applause for the weather, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, okay, got one thumbs down. I'm off to a pretty good start so far tonight, though. This is good. Uh, glad to see everybody here. Uh, thank you to Bobby for doing the music this morning. I know uh, you always do a good job. And I want to tell you how good of a job your son did this morning leading the music, which he's been doing. Uh, for a while now, but I, I really enjoyed hearing uh, hearing Philip there. And, um, I thank you, Sean. I know you filled in doing uh, announcements and stuff this morning. At least I, I think you did. I nailed it. Did you? Okay. I thought, I thought you were going to say you passed it off to somebody, but that's, that's good. I don't know any announcements, so if you're curious, see Sean. He's, he's got it all. But uh, I do know this. The ladies, there is a sign-up sheet back there in the foyer, and if, uh, if you want to participate in the, uh, the, the brunch that they're doing, uh, is that that's what the sign-up sheet is for, you can... Uh, you can jot your name down back there. Also, the Bible study they're doing on Tuesday nights. Uh, we're thankful for our WMU. I, that's, a, that's a really good thing for a church to have. And I'm, I'm glad for the ones that have started it, you that have been a part of it now for, I guess, maybe a year or, or, or less uh, that we've had a WMU. But it's a really good thing for a church to have. Not, not just the Bible studies, but the missions and the, doing the prison bags um, and, and uh, school bags like backpacks, school supplies, and the different things already that y'all have done. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for our WMU. Um, thank you all for, you know, just for letting me be able to, to miss this morning, too. And uh, I, I heard that John did a good job. Uh, I knew that he would. I, I looked on it. It wasn't on YouTube yet, so maybe it will be up there later. But, um, but thank you for letting me uh, be able to do that this morning. And, and I miss you guys. I'm, I'm glad to be back here tonight, though. Uh, it's an honor to get to stand back up here once again. Uh, I don't know of any other announcements that are uh, pressing. I know the, the newsletter doesn't look that good, but uh, it is in the bulletin if you didn't get one. Just uh, the, we've been having some technical difficulties around here, so uh, that all, long story short, it resulted in a, a pretty poor looking newsletter, but uh, it is what it is. Next month's will look a little bit better, but the information in it should all be uh, there just the same. So if you have any uh, questions about that, make sure you ask or grab a newsletter or bulletin if you haven't got one, and uh, all that you need to know should probably be in there. So we'll have a word of prayer, and uh, we will get into uh, the message tonight. I will say this before I begin the message that we were going on Sunday nights and here going through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I didn't get to the wise and foolish builders, and I, I just kind of made a comment, said, I'll, I'm going to do that, you know, a little while down the road, but uh, that'll be tonight. So we started the Fixer Upper series last week, Becoming the Person that God Wants You to Be, and it begins with us laying a firm foundation. We talked last week about Demo Day, knocking down the old, making room for the new, um, but we need to have a strong foundation in our lives, and so I, I put off the wise and foolish builders, and we're going to get to them tonight, so I want to say that now so I don't... Uh, don't say that when we get started, but that's, that's kind of why we do that. So we'll have a word of prayer, and then we will uh, jump into Matthew chapter 7. So will you pray with me, please? Lord, I thank you so much for another day of life you've given to us. I thank you that we can gather here tonight. I thank you for uh, what's already happened, singing. Well, what a great song, and what a day that will be. And it's one that, that we as Christians can look forward to because uh, we have loved ones that are on the other side. But more importantly than, than uh, a home in heaven and to whatever beauty awaits us there, we know that you are there and we get to spend eternity with you. And so what a day that will be. And I know that we can sing that looking forward to it. And Lord, I pray that maybe that would just warm somebody's heart here tonight. But I pray for the ones that are not able to be here tonight. And I know that we have uh, some that are sick. I know we have some that are battling different types of illnesses and bugs that are going around cold and flu-like symptoms and all that stuff is, has begun already. So Lord, I pray for all the ones that are not feeling well. Pray that you heal them up and uh, get them to recover very quickly. And for the ones that are that are shut in, the ones that are in nursing homes and things, Lord, I pray that that uh, they would not feel forgotten tonight, that they would know they have a church family that still loves them. Lord, I pray for all of our soldiers who are deployed, and I pray especially for Keith right out of this church, Lord, and I pray that you protect him and bring him home safely, as well as everyone else who wears the uniform. And Lord, I pray for the families while they're separated. I pray that you would uh, take care of any needs that might arise, but Lord, I also pray that uh, for the emotional separation as well, Lord, I pray that you would help those families and friends to, uh, to make it through this time. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we get to watch our soldiers come in and wave those American flags and give you the credit for bringing them home safely. So that's what we're asking you for here tonight. And, uh, and on that note, I pray for our commander in chief, President Trump, and I pray for the decisions he has to make.
that it's easy for us to, to armchair quarterback it, but, uh, but we don't know a quarter of the stuff that he knows that he's uh, informed of and, and made aware of. And so much that's classified that would probably uh, make us turn gray the minute we heard it. And so, Lord, I, I pray for him with the decisions he has to make. Because uh, he makes decisions that directly affect our soldiers. They affect families. They affect citizens. And so I pray that you give him the wisdom to make the right decisions to keep our people safe. And uh, Lord, more than that, I pray for his soul. I pray that uh, he says he's a Christian. If that's the case, I pray that he grow in his faith every day and that he would be salt and light from the White House. And Lord, if he's not saved, I pray that you would save him, that you would put people around him to, to preach the truth to him and not be intimidated by him, but uh, to let him know what your word teaches. And Lord, I pray for all of our leadership. I pray for the decision makers. I pray that you give them wisdom. I pray for this church. And Lord, I'm thankful for Putnam and for what this church has done for more than two centuries, what you've done through this church, and I pray that you continue to use us. Lord, I pray that you bless us. I pray that you continue to provide the funds that we need to do ministry. I pray that you provide the workers uh, because the field is white and we need workers out in the harvest. And I pray that you would provide uh, the opportunities for us. I pray that you give us a vision. I pray that we'd be obedient to do what you lead us to do, that we'd go out in the highways and hedges of Union County and we would compel them to come. So, Lord, I pray not only for your blessings on this church, but for us as individuals who make up this church, that you bless us in all that we do in our work, in our school, in our hobbies, in running errands, and, and all that we've got going on in our lives. Lord, I pray for your hand of blessing on us. Lead us by your Holy Spirit, and I pray that we'd be obedient to follow you. So, again, I thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for all that you do for us. I know you've been so good to me. I, I know if we all were to start sharing stories and giving testimony, we could probably be here all night. But, Lord, I pray that we never take for granted what you do, and I pray that you would be with us now as we open your word, that you would speak to our hearts, and I pray for a good night here, and our, our kids in uh, the choir practice do the same thing. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in December of 2001, the Leaning Tower of Pisa was reopened to the public. I didn't know this until recently, but actually for a span of almost 12 years, the Leaning Tower of Pisa was actually closed. They wouldn't let people get near it. Uh, even tourists that, that might have traveled a great distance to see it, they could not see it because they closed it down for renovation. The reason it was closed for renovation is the tower was leaning. Now, you probably already knew that, didn't you? It's in the name. But it was leaning a little too far. And so what they had to do is go in and remove a lot of the dirt around it and then begin to work on the foundation of the structure. In fact, 110 tons of dirt were removed. And uh, about $25 million was spent on this project. The reason for that, they said it was, uh, it was leaning about 16 inches more than it was supposed to. It was getting closer to the ground. And authorities in Italy said, if we don't do something to this tower, it may very soon collapse. So $25 million, 110 tons of dirt, and 12 years later, the leaning tower was corrected. Uh, the, the problem with the tower was not bad design. It wasn't that they used an inferior grade of steel when they built it. It was not anything about the craftsmanship of the people that worked on it. The problem with the Leaning Tower of Pisa was quite simply the foundation upon which it stood. It was built directly onto the sand in the city of Pisa, and uh, the sandy soil there is just not stable enough to support a monument of that size. The tower had no firm foundation. I believe you know this, but any building, any structure, it needs a firm foundation. The building that we are gathered in here tonight, it needs a firm foundation. Your house, no matter the size of it, it needs a firm foundation. The Leaning Tower of Pisa needs a firm foundation. But more importantly than any of that, if you think of our lives as a building, they need a firm foundation. So we started this series on the fixer-upper. And our lives, I said, are like fixer-uppers, where Jesus comes in. Last week we talked about having that demo day of him knocking down the old and making room for the new. If you watch those shows, like fixer-upper, or some of the ones that are similar to it, so many times they come in and they've got this big, scary moment. They say, we've got a problem here. And the, the architect or the foreman or somebody might say, we've got some foundation issues. You know, we found some cracks in the foundation. Oh, my goodness, how much is that going to set us back? Well, it's going to be expensive. And they've got to bring in crews there. They've got to bring in different things to fix and repair that foundation. Maybe that's where someone in this room is tonight. You're a Christian. You know, you've allowed the Lord to remove the old in your life, the stuff we talked about last week. But maybe if you're honest with yourself, if you were to do some examining, you might say, I've got some cracks in my foundation. 
I have not built my house on the solid rock. Maybe like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you say, my life is built on the shifting sands instead of the reliable rock of Jesus and his word. I'm going to invite you to Matthew chapter 7 tonight because what we're going to look at comes from the mouth of Jesus and he gives it as the conclusion to his Sermon on the Mount. We went all through the Sermon on the Mount and we, we left off here just a few weeks ago. So tonight we're going to really finish that as part of the series. We're going to read a couple of verses together and then we'll kind of pick them apart kind of line by line here. But beginning in verse 24, here's what Jesus says at the very end of his sermon. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But the good news is, he says, it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. That's a great conclusion to Jesus' sermon. I mean, that is a great way, after he's preached for, for you know, this is one of the longest uh, sermons we have here with Jesus. After he's preached this long sermon, at the very end of it, he gives the wise and foolish builders as a conclusion. I mean, this is just a masterful way to end this great sermon. He's saying, guys, here is the application. You've been sitting here and nodding your heads and with everything I've told you. You know, you're saying, that's right, Jesus. Amen. That's good preaching, Jesus. But here's what it really comes down to. Are you going to leave this place, nod in agreement, say, okay, and then not doing a thing about it? Or are you going to leave here saying, that's right, Jesus. Now let me go apply what you just said to my life. It's not just about hearing the instruction. It's about application. It's about taking it and actually doing it. How does James say it? He says, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer as well. Don't be a hearer only, but be a doer. And what does he say the hearers only are doing? The guys in our Thursday morning Bible study, we've memorized this verse. He says, you are deceiving yourselves. If you are a hearer only, yes, Jesus, yes, that's right. Or yes, preacher, that's right. And you're a hearer only, but you don't do what you just heard. You're deceiving yourself. You're making yourself think, my life's good. I'm okay. I've got it all together. I'm living the good Christian life. You're a hearer only if you're not doing what Jesus said. So in context, he's concluding the Sermon on the Mount. All the things that we talked about. The Beatitudes. His teaching on anger and lust and adultery. His teaching on honesty. And swearing oaths and just being a generally honest person. His teaching on prayer and fasting and the golden rule. And he summed all that up by saying, now go and do what you've just heard. But this is not limited to only the Sermon on the Mount. He says, whoever hears these words of mine, I believe all the words of Jesus, apply just as much as the Sermon on the Mount. More than that, I believe all the words of Scripture apply just as much as the Sermon on the Mount. So it's Paul's teaching on the Trinity in Ephesians. It's John's teaching on brotherly love. It's Peter's teaching on false prophets. It's James' teaching on learning how to withstand trials and grow through the change. It's all the things that we read in the Word of God. We, when we hear them, we need to do them as well. Don't just be hearers, but be doers. Don't build your house on the sand, but build your house upon the rock. So let's talk about those three things today. The, the two types of people he talks about. And then what happens to him in the end? Let's begin by talking about the wise. Did you ever sing that song when you were a kid, by the way? The wise man built his house upon the rock. Did you ever hear that? And the rains came down and the floods came up. I used to love singing that song in children's church. Anything with hand motions is good for kids. But the rains came down, the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the winds and the, the what does it say? The, how's it go? Oh, my mind just went blank. Doesn't matter, you know it. <laughs> but then it says the house on the rock stood firm. And that's the key right there. Why? Why does the house on the rock stand firm? The wise man understands the importance of a strong foundation. And therefore, before he builds his house, he says, I need to make sure that regardless of whether we've picked out the color of paint we want, regardless of if we know what kind of countertops we're going to have, how many bathrooms and bedrooms, I need to make sure we have a strong foundation. Now for me, I don't know a whole lot about the foundation of any house I've ever been in. 
That's not really my forte. My grandfather was one of those guys that when he walks into a place, he's checking it all out. He's, he's tapping on things, and he's always messing with things. And, he's, I, and I know some of you are like that too, and you're curious, and you look at how it's put together, and you're examining everything. I just trust it all works. You know, I just walk in and say, someone probably did a good enough job with this, and I don't give it much of a crack. And, and for most of us, unless we physically build our own houses, we don't put a whole lot of thought into the foundation, but not so in Jesus' audience. They were much more involved in the building of where they lived. See, when you're about to get married in that culture, for example, you're a young man and you tell your bride, hey, we're going to get married. Now I'm going to go prepare a place for you in my father's house. And you go back to your home and you begin, you and your dad and you know brothers and people around the community, you begin to physically build onto the house. We call it contracting, most of us, right? And, but some of you know a little bit more about what you're doing. But I just assume that the foundation is good. But he's talking to people that knew for a fact that the foundation was good because they were the ones who dug it. They were the ones who worked on it. They were the ones who made sure it was level. They were the ones who made sure it was strong enough. They were intimately familiar with their foundation. And Jesus says a wise person makes sure that it is built upon the rock. A firm foundation is vital to the long-term success of any structure. Now, if you have a weak foundation, you can probably get away with it for a little while, can't you? So that at first glance, everything might look normal from the outside looking in. But we're talking about withstanding the test of time. There's plenty of people that look like they've got it all together. You get on their Facebook page, and their pictures are just so nice. Their family is perfect. It looks like it's right out of a magazine. And then they love their job. And, you know, everything in their family is great. Kids are always great. Nothing in life ever goes wrong. And you ever find yourself thinking, man, I wish I had their life. Anybody ever done that? You don't have to raise your hand. Man, if, I, if my life was just more like them, if I could just have the things that they have, what you don't realize is they may be built upon a faulty structure. And we might spend so much time idolizing what other people have, not realizing that for them it may all come crumbling down. I'm not saying you should pull for that. Don't get jealous and hope. That it comes crashing down. But, but for sometimes we, we idolize these people. We want what they have. And what they have might not really be all that it's cracked up to be. At first glance, it might look really good. But we're talking about long-term success. When Jesus says rock, you want to know what the Greek word for that is? If you are familiar with this concept, it will mean something to you right away. The Greek word for rock that the wise man builds on is Petra. You know, we, we see that come up again in Scripture. Whose nickname is Petra? Peter. Peter, the disciple. The famous Peter. That's not his real name, though, is it? That's his nickname. What's his real name? Simon. His name is Simon, but Jesus calls him Petra. Jesus is calling him, or, or Petros, I should say. Jesus is calling him a rock. Now, this word for rock is not quite the same word for Peter. And that's what makes this so interesting. I, I love this about Peter. His name is Simon, but Jesus calls him Rock. Any Clemson fans in here? The rock that Jesus calls Peter, I would compare it to Howard's rock. And you go out there and you touch the rock. Is it true that the coach used that as a doorstop in his office? Because I've always heard that. The, the rock that the players run out and touch was once the doorstop in Coach Howard is his name. I guess Coach Howard's office. And so the, the players go and they touch his old doorstop. I know it doesn't really sound that cool if you, if you say what it is. It might give you goosebumps as a Clemson fan. Just a big doorstop is all that was. And that's similar to the word that Peter calls, or that Jesus calls Simon. So here's what Jesus does. His name is Simon, but Jesus says, Peter, you're going to be my rock. I need you to be my rock. You're the leader of the disciples. You're going to lead the first church. And I need you, Peter, to grow into this role of being the rock. As often as Peter does something stupid, what does Jesus say? Simon, Simon. We see that in Luke 23. Uh, you know, Peter's saying, oh, no, 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 Lord, I'll never, I'll never, I'm never going to deny you. Simon, here you go again. Oh, no, 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 Lord, don't, don't you wash my feet. Well, I've got to wash your feet. Well, not just my feet, then my head, my hands, everything. Simon, just relax. I mean, every time he misses the mark, Jesus says, come on, Simon. But whenever he does something really good, Jesus says, Peter, you know, we don't, we don't really get the emphasis when we read it. But I can imagine that Jesus says it in such a way that it makes Peter feel pretty good about himself. He just called me the rock again. And so when, when uh, for example, Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? I mean, some say I'm Elijah, some say I'm one of the prophets, but what about you? And what does 
old Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon. But then he goes on and says, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. So he says, you are Petros. You are Howard's rock. You are that doorstop. You are this big rock. But he says, I'm going to build my church, not on you, Peter, not on a doorstop, but on Petra, on the much larger immovable rock, that large slab, something capable of supporting a structure. So get this. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church on a Petra. I need something strong enough for my church to be built on. And that is the very structure that he says, if you're wise, you'll build your house on that. You will build your life on that. Not something that is shaky, not something that sways and gives, but a large slab, sturdy and immovable. So the wise man builds his home on the Petra. Uh, a, a weak house will have a crumbling base. A weak house is not gonna be able to withstand but if you have built your house on a firm foundation, then you're going to be okay. So what is then the Petra? What's the firm foundation? It's in the verse. It's right there on the screen. He says, whoever hears these words of mine, you want to build your house on the rock? You build it on these words of Jesus. You build your life on his teaching. You build your life on the parables. You build your life on the red letters. You build your life not just on the words of Jesus, because he is the word. You build it on everything else contained in the rest of this book. If you want to be built on something that stands, you build it upon the words of Jesus Christ. So that means when you hear the preacher, that means when you hear your Sunday school teacher, that means when you hear someone, a preacher on TV, that book that you're reading, if it's the word of God, when you hear it, you begin to put it into your life. You begin to use it as your foundation. No matter how long you've been saved, no matter how old you are, you can always work on your foundation. Always make sure that you are adding layers to it, that you are strengthening it, even if it's not very strong right now. In a parallel passage, Luke chapter 6, verse 47, Jesus is talking about the wise and foolish builders. He adds a little bit to it. The wise man, he says, digs deep. He goes out and he digs his own foundation. He puts the work into it himself. He rolls up his sleeve. He puts on his work gloves. He grabs the shovel and the wheelbarrow. He does the work himself. He doesn't trust somebody else is going to do it for him. He doesn't put his faith in the opinion of someone else. But he gets to work digging deep the foundation of his own life. You know what that means to me? That means that we've got to put some work into it. I'd love for my life to be built on Jesus, but I'm just too busy. No wrong answer. If we want our lives to be built on a firm foundation, we've got to make a little bit of investment, our own time, reading, studying, praying over it, our resources. Buy yourself a study Bible, a Bible dictionary, some commentaries. Buy some things that can assist you along the way. Go to a Sunday school class if you haven't joined one. Why not get an extra half hour of teaching each week? Come back on Wednesday night if you don't already. Why not get an extra half hour of someone teaching the Bible? And while you're at it, you can take your kids to Awana. You can take your youth into the youth room so that they can get extra Bible teaching as well. Put some work into it. Dig the foundation. Make the investment. And that's what a wise person will do. You know what wise means in Greek? Or, or what word it comes from in Greek? It's sophos. I've said this before. The name Sophia. I love the name Sophia because it, it comes from this word. And it's the Greek word for wisdom. So here's what Jesus says, because Sophos gives us our word for sophisticated. Here's what Jesus says. If you hear what I say and you apply it to your life, you are sophisticated. Now, that might be quite a compliment. You might say, well, I've never considered myself to be the sophisticated type. Anybody ever say something like that? I was talking to somebody just this morning. He said he made a comment about, well, you know, hillbillies like me. Hey, I don't care if you're a hillbilly or not. I don't care if you're sitting in your country. I don't care if you're educated or not. If you hear the words of Jesus and you build your life upon that, Jesus says you are high society. So past the bread coupon and the caviar, my friends, you are sophisticated. doesn't matter what level of education you have. doesn't matter what you might know. doesn't matter if you're good with math or you know science or you remember history or you speak with proper grammar. If you hear the words of Jesus and you build your life on that, 
Jesus says you are sophisticated. You are wise. So don't sell yourself so short. The wise person will build his house upon the rock. That's what the wise man does. But there are some who are not so sophisticated. There are, there are some who are not wise enough to build their lives upon the rock. They are weak-minded and foolish. So we've talked about the wise, but in verse 26 now we see the weak. And we've read it, you see it on the screen again, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. He's saying, well, what should I compare him to? What would I liken him to? How about a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand? I'm more of a mountain person myself than a beach person. I don't know if I'm the only one here. I love going away to the mountains. Um, I just happened to have married into a beach family. So because of that, we, we typically compromise and uh, go to the beach. So uh, that's, that's generally what we do. A uh, little, little joke there, don't tell her I said. Uh, I, I like going to the beach as long as I have access to a hotel. I hate sand, sunscreen, the sun, the water. Amen. Amen. I think that's about it. I think I covered it. Uh, but other than that, I love the beach, right? I mean, that's if you could just get rid of those things, I, I'd be just purely happy. But but uh, we, we have had the pleasure of staying in some nice uh, places over the years. And uh, one of my favorite places that we stayed was South Padre Island, Texas. It's, it's right there, uh, just on the right beside Mexico. We actually went into Mexico on that trip. First vacation we ever took after moving to South Carolina in 2008. Reagan wasn't born yet. And it was our first getaway. Alicia's parents had rented this place in South Padre Island. They invited us to come stay. I said, all right, well, hey, free house, let's do it. And so we, we flew out there, and uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's an island. We had to drive onto a ferry and let that ferry drive, or, or you know, take us to the, uh, onto the island. And it was beautiful. It was remote. I, I mean, there was nobody there. And we stayed in this place that was built up on stilts. It was private. We'd open up the back doors. And we had a private beach. I mean, there was nobody around. And it was really nice. But then we started watching the weather while we were there. It was summer in Texas. It's hurricane season. And we began to watch the weather. They're, they're saying, this hurricane's coming in. It's going to be a doozy. Get out of town. They start telling people, going to be mandatory evacuations. You know, cut your vacation short or don't come. And we're thinking, man, this is starting to look pretty bad. We're set to leave the next day. And so we decided that we would, you know, leave on time, you know, just like we were going to. And when we got home and we watched the weather as it began to pound South Padre Island and parts of South Texas, the Gulf of Mexico, it looked really bad. So we went to the same website where we booked that house and found out that the house was completely destroyed when that hurricane came through. And I wasn't surprised by that at all. I remember saying they're looking at it, they're saying hurricanes are coming. I'm looking at this house, it's built up on stilts, right on the sand, I mean just 10 feet from the water, I'm thinking, this house doesn't have a chance. I mean, it's a beautiful house, but I mean, it seemed like if the big bad wolf huffed and puffed hard enough, he could blow the house down. There's no way it's gonna survive this hurricane, and it didn't, and why is that? The house was beautiful, I mean, everything in it looked nice, it was decorated well, but the problem is, it was built on sand. We could talk about proximity to the water, but it was built right on the sand and it lacked any kind of foundation. I don't know why anyone would have built it there. It was nice while it lasted, but when the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, well, it fell because it was built upon the sand. If the rock <coughs> is hearing the words of Jesus, then what is the sand? I think it's the exact opposite. It's hearing it but not doing it. It's being a hearer only, but not also a doer. I like how John MacArthur defined it. MacArthur says that the sand is our self-will, self-fulfillment, self-purpose, self-sufficiency, self-satisfaction, and self-righteousness. All that focus on self instead of Jesus will leave a person severely disappointed. When we build our lives on the sand, we're building it on something that is not going to last. Now, the sand could be well-meaning advice. It's just not based on the Bible. Hey, God just wants you to be happy. Well, that's just not biblical. It could be, on the other hand, it could be false religions. Oh, there's plenty of ways to heaven. And people that build their lives upon that stuff are really just building a structure on the sand. It may get by for a little while. You might have a nice vacation, but you know it's just not going to make it in the end. Wise comes from Sophos, where we get sophisticated, but foolish comes from moros, from which we get moron. Isn't that nice? Jesus says, whoever hears these words and does not do them will be likened unto a 
moron, a moronic person. Now, that, that was not the word that Jesus used, but it's where we get our word for moron. So which one are you? Are you sophisticated or are you moronic? Are you a moron? I wouldn't call you that to your face, by the way, but you do some self-evaluation and ask yourself, am I building my life on the teachings of Jesus, the unchanging, eternal word of God, or am I building it based upon the shifting sands of the wisdom of this world? That's what sand does. It moves. It gives way. Most often when we use the word sand, we're using it in the singular. We say, oh, look at the sand. Let's go out on the sand. Oh, I just want to get out there and sit on the sand. We're talking about billions or trillions of tiny little sand particles, and we call it all the sand. But it's really made up of so many individual things. It should be plural, right? It's all of this sand, and because it's so many microscopic little things there, that every time you step in it, it's all displaced, right? You put your foot down, and it all spreads out of the way. The wind blows, and it blows the sand. You go out there and you put your little lawn chairs and stuff and you start sinking lower and lower into it the longer you sit there. That's what I do when I go to the beach because once again, I don't go in the water because I hate it. So I, I park myself in a lawn chair. I sit there most of the day and by the time I'm ready to get up, I'm like three feet lower to the ground. And that, that's pretty much my day at the beach because that's what sand does. It gives way. And if we think I can build my life on this stuff, then one day we're going to see that it gives way. Like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, it wasn't standing straight, and then in a minute leans down 16 inches. But over the course of hundreds of years, it gave a little more, and a little more, and a little more. And that's what happens to so many moronic people. They don't realize that they're drifting a little bit further away, a little bit further away. It's a series of compromises. It's a series of bad decisions. It's one bad choice resulting in another. It's lying to cover up a lie. It's making excuses to cover up bad decisions. And before we realize it, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, we are 16 inches closer to the ground than we were when we started. We say, how did my life ever get here? It's not like I went and just you know, made some really stupid decision and ruined my life. No, it's just slowly given way because we did not have a firm foundation. It doesn't work for our houses. It certainly is not going to work for our lives. Are you wise or are you foolish? Do you hear the words and apply them? Or do you hear them and ignore them? We've seen the wise and the weak and what they do. But what really makes the difference when the problem is really exposed, when a person is really tested, is when it comes down to this. It comes down to the weather. When the weather strikes, that's how we know if the foundation is good or not. When the weather strikes, when the weather gets bad, that's how we know if your life is built on something firm or if it's all just been built on a house of sand. Look at verse 25 and then 27 and note how similar the two verses are. Verse 25 says, And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. 27 is so similar. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against the house. That is word for word what verse 25 says, and then just a tiny little difference. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. Just a slight difference. One stands, one falls. The song we sang in children's church, the house on the rock stood firm, and we would do this, stood firm. But in children's church, we'd also sing about the house on the sand, and it went Splat. Remember singing that? What makes the difference between standing firm or going splat? What makes the difference in your life whether you stand or fall? Whether you withstand the test of time or not? What makes the difference? And it all comes down to that, fa that foundation. But Jesus says the wind blows. The rains fall. The floods rise. What is that? What do those things represent? One way of looking at it is we could say those represent the storms of life. You ever go through the storms of life? We all do. None of us are immune from the storms of life. What are the storms of life? You lose your job. Money gets tighter. You get sick. Your marriage falls apart. The kids rebel. You become an empty nester. You uh, find out that the things that you had put your faith in, the people that you put your faith in, they stab you in the back. They let you down. We could go on and on and on talking about whatever the storms of life are. 
Maybe it's a mess of our own making. Maybe we're the victim, but either way, the winds of life begin to blow. The rains of life begin to fall down. The floods of life begin to rise against us. And every one of us faces these storms of life. And if you have a strong foundation, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. If you have a strong foundation, though, you can withstand. You can go inside and you can shut the door and you can board up the windows and you can batten down the hatches. Whatever that means, I don't know. But you can go inside your house and with a strong structure, the storms of life may blow, but you know you're going to be okay. Man, there might be tears shed. There might be times spent on your knees. There might be times agonizing, crying out to God. But if the foundation is strong, if your life is built on the words of Jesus, then even when the going gets tough and you don't understand it, you say, I'm going to be all right because I'm standing on a firm foundation. But if you're not, if you've built your life on the wisdom of this world, if it's built on the shifting sands, then when you go through these things and you get sick and you just become a mess, you don't know what to do about it. You go through these things where people stab you in the back, you don't know what to do. You go through all the storms of life and you know what ends up happening? You get mad at God. You blame Him. You get out of church. You get out of your Bible. You get off your knees, and you find out that all that stuff that you once thought you were building your life on, but you weren't doing it the right way, it's not enough to support you when the going gets tough. It's not Jesus' fault. It's not the Bible's fault. It's not the church's fault. You're just nodding in agreement. You're hearing the words of Jesus, but you're not doing what he says. You're not putting it into use. You're not growing in your faith so that when the storms of life hit, your house goes flat. You don't have the strength to withstand it. That's one way of looking at the storms of life, but I want to offer another thought. I think the storms of life in this passage could just as much refer to the end of your life. Your time down here is up. It happens to every one of us. If the storm of life then could represent our death and our ultimate judgment, then those who have built our lives on the word of God are going to hear this. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come into this place that I have prepared for you, because you heard these words of mine, and you did them. You were saved the way I said to do it. You put your faith and your trust in me, and you built your house on me. But if you didn't do that, you're going to hear, instead, depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. To me, that is the ultimate crumbling of a house, isn't it? Everything I worked for, everything I thought I was doing my whole life, I, I set aside money, I took care of myself, I ate right, I exercised, I, I left everything in my will, I did all these things, and Jesus says, depart from me. You thought you were building up the right way, and when it's all said and done, when this life comes to an end, we find out that that foundation was not strong enough. So as I said a minute ago, on the outside looking in, we can't always tell. When Jesus gives this parable, I get a mental image of two people kind of side by side. I think of next door neighbors. One guy goes out and he digs deep and he builds a firm foundation. He's building his house and the next guy's taking shortcuts and he's watching this guy dig deep. He's watching this guy sweat. He's watching this guy put all this work into it. And he says, I got my house built a fraction of the time and I saved money while I was doing it. Look, my house is beautiful just like yours. And they both move in to their houses and they both live their lives. And little rainstorms come along the way and both of them are fine. And there might be some strong winds one day and both of them are fine. And, and there might be some things happen along the way, and, and they're both able to make it through for a while, but only one of them really withstands the test of time. From the outside, they both look right. Even the people living inside might have both felt secure. And it could be that you in your life tonight, you feel secure in the house that you have built for yourself. And you say, well, it's worked for me all this time. Hey, I mean, I've been doing it this long for so long, and no disaster has hit me. Don't deceive yourself. Don't be deceived. Don't just be a hearer. Make sure you're a doer. Maybe like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you need to do a renovation in your own life tonight. Here's the good news about Christ. See, because if you build your house on a faulty foundation, oftentimes the whole thing just is a complete waste. It's a wash and you have to start from scratch. But when we're talking about Jesus and our lives, even if it's not built on the right foundation, Jesus says, no problem. I'll be your contractor. I'll be your foreman. Me and the Holy Spirit, we will work with you to build up a structure and a foundation that you've never had. And you can begin a renovation right now. Hey, this is a fixer-upper, right? If your life is a fixer-upper and you say, I need to begin building it on the Word of God, you can begin even tonight 
You can begin to make some changes in your life tonight. You can begin to bring the teachings and the truth of Scripture into your life right now. And say, I'm just going to go through a renovation. And I'm going to begin to take what I've heard and apply it. I'm going to begin to do more digging myself. I'm going to get in the Word myself. I'm going to do more study myself. And I'm going to learn more and apply more so that my foundation will be strong. Church, I want to ask you this question tonight as I close. On what are you building your life? Are you building it on a Petra, on a reliable rock, on a firm foundation? Or are you building it on shifting sands and worldly wisdom? What kind of person are you? Are you sophisticated? Are you wise? Or are you moronic? Are you foolish? Jesus makes a very sharp contrast, and he puts us all in one camp or in one or the other. Which one are you? Need to make some changes tonight? No better time than right now. We can ask you to please stand up tonight. Right where you are with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I appreciate this Nancy uh, coming forward to play. And so maybe tonight you want to come down here to the altar and you want to kneel down and you want to pray and say, Lord, I need to make some changes. My foundation is faulty. I've got some work I need to do. Would you help me to begin to build up this structure in my life? And the Bible promises that he will do it. Maybe tonight there's something else in your life. Maybe you need to be saved. Maybe there's uh, some changes that you need to make otherwise. And you know what they are. And you want to use this opportunity right now to do it. Talk to God right where you stand. Come kneel at the altar. Come ask someone down here for prayer. Whatever you want to do, this time is for you. Lord, I pray that you would help us in these next few minutes to make any changes in our lives that we need to make to be the people you want us to be, to be built on the rock of your word and the truth of who you are. I thank you for who you are and this word that you've given to us. I ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. With this dancing.